There is nothing so emblematic of steam railroading as a roundhouse, especially when viewed from high altitude via the good offices of Google Earth. I reached that conclusion a few years ago when, quite obsessively, I got hooked on satellite imagery. Railroading is geography, someone once said, and nowhere was that more apparent than in the miraculously detailed images of the American landscape suddenly available to anyone, anytime. I dove in head first, surveilling every railroad I'd ever ridden and others I had yet to discover. After a while, I found myself fixating on something that reached out from the screen, demanding my attention, something recognizable almost before anything else, roundhouses. Circular and architecturally iconoclastic, they stick out amid a landscape of squares and rectangles. Inevitably, I began to make a list. My criterion was simple. I would include any roundhouse for which there was visible evidence, no matter how scant. I'm now up to more than 530. There are likely more to discover. In a March 2010 essay for Trains Magazine, historian John Hankey noted that at one time there were more than 3,000 roundhouses in North America, an unsurprising number when you consider not only the pervasiveness of steam, but also the strictures of the typical 100-mile crew district. In that labor-intensive world, railroads put up roundhouses and fueling and watering facilities at points where train speeds, engine crew pay rates, fuel consumption, and necessary maintenance said they had to be put up. Quote, no matter what configuration, the roundhouse had one overarching function, Hanke wrote, to receive a high-maintenance, complex, hard-run machine at the end of one operating cycle and make it ready for another trip. The roundhouse was a 24-7 operation, humming to the ebb and flow of incoming and outgoing locomotives and road crews. Images of locomotives and hostlers functioning in the shadows of a roundhouse are a standard subject for railroad photographers, but perhaps these structures are best appreciated from above, where their form follows function practicality and beauty is so obvious. Unlike the bi-directional diesels that conquered them, steam locomotives were nearly always fated to move in one direction. They had to be turned at the end of each run. The solution was a circular edifice, a turntable, surrounded by the corresponding radii of whisker tracks and maintenance stalls. As a practical matter, the iron horses disappeared 60 years ago, but their stables didn't fade away, not completely. Locomotives were easy to scrap, not so the massively built roundhouse, with its deep substructure of reinforced concrete inspection pits designed to bear the weight of multiple 200-ton machines. Even when the building above is gone, the roundhouse often lingers, its foundation resistant to economical removal. Some of the most haunting images here are those gray and ghostly footprints emerging from the dirt and weeds, examples of a special kind of antiquity. Must art be created willfully, deliberately? In Art and Intention, a Philosophical Study, his widely praised book on the subject, philosopher Paisley Livingston posits that, quote, intentions are necessary to the making of art, unquote, and that even happy accidents of spontaneous art are grounded in aesthetic purpose. If that's the case, do these pictures from space belong here? After all, the Landsat 7 and 8 satellites that produced these from an altitude of 438 miles scarcely cared whether they were photographing Walmart parking lots or national forests. Art and aesthetics were beside the point. Still, these images compel, their lovely arcs set against a harsh industrial background, reminding us of a time when they were alive with the sights and sounds of boilermakers' hammers, clanking rods, steam pipes, whistles, and voices. The stuff of art. <laughs>